episode seven in the series Spiritual Lessons from World War One. You know, it's interesting because when you talk about a world war, you expect a lot of battle. And so far, uh, I don't even know that we've heard one gun go off. Uh, so it's sort of, if, if we've heard one, oh yeah, we did, Gavrilo Princip's <laughs> gun, we did hear that one. Uh, and that wasn't even in the sense of war, that was just a terrorist act. And, but it is interesting because this is a very, very bloody war over the four years, and yet we haven't even gotten to it. And my emphasis, just for those of you that aren't really that interested in the bloody side of World War I, my interest isn't necessarily the bloody side of World War I either. It plays a part in understanding the human drama in this. If, you know, as, as, a, as a man, when you stick yourself in the trenches, it's a very, very trying and testing thing to see how you would respond if you were in these situations. And uh, it's, it's challenging. It, it has to rank in the top five, maybe worst places to be in all of world history. Uh, it would be a trench in, on the Western Front in World War I. I mean, that's how bad it is. And, and so that's the season of history we're entering into, but that's not necessarily my desire is to just bring us into that trench and have us sit there for the remainder of our uh, our, our training as we go through this, because there's so many human elements to this, that's one, and we probably will visit a trench, you know, and actually say, hey guys, this is, this is where they hung out. But, uh, you know, I, that's one of the challenges of teaching on World War I. How do you do this? This is just ugly. Everything about it's ugly. Why would you bring it up? How could this be edifying? It's a good question. Uh, and you could look at all of Earth's history and say the same. You know, there's a lot in the Bible you could say, well, that's not very edifying. I mean, why would we talk about Ahab and Jezebel? Oh, why would we talk about what happened in the book of Judges? And I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that's, you know, not that, you could say not that edifying, but it is edifying, depending on which set of glasses you put on. Because sometimes what is edifying is that which contrasts with the kingdom of heaven, and as a result enables us to see our soul the way it is. You know, and as we go through this and as we see William II, or Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, you oftentimes can see reflections of yourself, and you recognize that this led to world war. And praise God that we're not in a position of being a Kaiser, <laughs> because as a result, when we are living in sin, we could create great drama throughout the earth, which is why even though we may not be in a position of a king or a queen, we are in a position to influence the world in which we live, and may we do it in a manner that uh, is more Albert the First esque than William the Second esque. In this part seven, it's called the French Fury. It was funny because it popped up on my uh, screen, and I just saw the French, f and it looked like the French fries, and I got sort of. Uh, <laughs> Got a little hungry uh, when I saw that, uh, and then I recognized, okay, that's not what this is. I'm not giving a message on the French fries. Uh, but the French Fury, this is, uh, you know, we've sort of taken some different looks, glimpses from different countries. We haven't really brought in Russia yet. I've only hinted at Russia and some of the dynamics up in Russia, where you had Alexander III who wouldn't look uh, Kaiser Wilhelm in the face, and he would only sneer at him over his shoulder. You know, so we have a little taste of the Tsardom up in Russia, and Great Britain, we don't know that much. We just know that Edward VII died back in 1910, had a funeral that was quite illustrious, and George took his place. It's like, and we've had a few quotes from uh, Winston Churchill. But long and short, we're still a little unfamiliar with what's going on in Great Britain. We've spent a lot of our time in Germany, and we spent a little time Austria-Hungary because we had Gavrilo Princip uh, come in and shoot the Archduke, but not a lot. In other words, you might feel fairly smart now after six messages on World War I, but technically we hardly know a thing, right? If you want to see the global, and that's one of the other things that's very daunting about World War I is you're dealing with so many nations that all have a backstory, that have leaders, and it's not just one leader, they have a whole bunch of leaders. And if you were to dive deep just into the history of Austria-Hungary, which isn't as interesting to many people because it, it dis dissipates after the war and is no, no more. So it's like, why spend any time studying Austria-Hungary? It's about to end. And yet so much is leading to these events. So much of the thinking. There is a character in the mid-1800s that is going to publish a book known as The Origin of the Species. And this is going to 
amazingly play into World War I. I mean, how could a book by Charles Darwin in the 1850s play into a war in 1914? It's just a book. And how could a book influence a world? And yet, it is going to. And that's part of what I wanted to address today, more in a light level. I'm not just going to go in depth into a lot of the thinking because we don't have time to show all the nuance, but you can at least, we can sort of surf on the wave of it and go, wow, that is quite interesting. The country of France is struggling and they are, they've gone through tremendous upheavals. They're sort of in their third version of a republic and they are struggling to sort of find their footing, which makes them appear very vulnerable right now. And Germany is licking its chops. There is, you know, France has sort of been the historic power of Europe. And, you know, Napoleon, all I have to do is say that name, and that triggers, you know, certain understanding in many of us. And so they've, in a sense, been the dominant factor in European landscape until 1870. And so we're in 1914, okay? So it's been 44 years since an empire bloomed, and that's called the German Empire. The German Empire didn't exist until 1871, and that's a result of something that happened in 1870 to 1871 called the Franco-Prussian, or some people would just call it the Franco-German, which makes, us, makes more sense to us, war. France and Germany are going to go to war, and it's not going to go so well for France. The, one, the power that's used to winning, in fact, no one would have ever thought that they could even lose this and yet the shocker of all shockers, Germany's going to come out on top, or Prussia at the time. It wasn't actually a nation. And there's a whole bunch of small nations in this that are going to ally together to take on the big guy. And France is going to lose big. It's going to lose big. And as a result, you're going to see a whole bunch of dominoes fall. One of those dominoes is Germany is going to become a nation. Suddenly, the biggest nation, most powerful nation in all of Europe switched from being France to Germany. And Germany just started existing, and it's already the most powerful nation in Europe. Okay, that immediately destabilizes everyone else, because now suddenly you have a new boy on the block, and obviously likes to fight. And so you can just sort of feel the insecurity that's now breeding, and why Germany feels like everyone's out to get them. So that's the insecurity of William. It's like, hey, how come no one respects me? No one really likes you. You're new. You don't deserve the privileges of the long-standing empires around here. And you're a bully. You know, you're just sort of a rude character. So this is going to lead to something that I'm going to refer to as the French Fury. That's actually the name of it. If you translate it, it's called the French Fury, which I think is a pretty cool title. So if you've ever heard of the Treaty of Versailles. That's a famous statement. However, in 1919, there was a Treaty of Versailles, and it is going to be a, the, the finishing touches to World War I. I don't want to give any spoilers of who's going to win World War I, because if you don't know, I don't want to tell you. I mean, that's part of the fun of going through a series here. And yet, the Treaty of Versailles is going to be the finishing touches to World War I, which just hint, hint, is actually going to lead to World War II because the treaty is going to be so unfair and biased in one side of the ledger that it's going to create a whole catastrophe moving forward. Ironically, that's not the first Treaty of Versailles. There's a Treaty of Versailles in 1871. And France, after losing the Franco-Prussian War, is going to be humiliated in and through this treaty. First of all, Versailles is the palace of French kings. So where does Germany this new startup country want to have the meetings, basically in the spit in the eye uh, location uh, uh, in France to say, hey, let's take one of your power positions and let's humiliate you and have you bend your knee before us there. Okay, so this is uncomfortable at every level. And the French aren't really enjoying this process, if you can imagine. I mean, there are proud people, but so are the Germans, so are the Brits. I mean, everyone's a proud people, if you wanna say it. That's human nature to be proud. And this isn't going so well. So France, a country stripped bare and humiliated. So the Treaty of Versailles, if you want to try and read it uh, off to the left, uh, you'd probably have to zoom in a little. It's going to be hard. My goal wasn't to get you to read it. I'm just going to give a summary of what took place. Prussia, soon to become Germany, resoundingly defeated France in the Franco-Prussian War. 
German troops had besieged Paris, captured the French emperor, Napoleon III, at the town of Sedan, and brought the nation of France to its knees. The Germans chose Versailles, the palace of French kings, as the place to write up the treaty agreement to end the conflict. This treaty of Versailles forced France to pay a war indemnity of 5 billion gold francs. That's the equivalent to a quarter of France's annual economic output. And to then, to ensure, I don't know why it has, it's written that way, but the two, then to ensure this payment, German troops occupied French industrial areas until the full balance was paid. So we're going to keep our soldiers here in your industrial zones until you've paid us back 5 billion gold francs, which is not going to be easy. In fact, Germany was figuring this could take like an entire generation to pay back. So it was going to cripple France for a generation. Now, side note, France is so undesirous of having the Germans in their environment, okay, the Hun, in their backyard, and they can't stand that, that they are going to pull off this in three years. The entire nation is going to work together, and they're going to get it done just to get Germany out. But it has so crippled the nation. They can't expand their military. They can't do anything. They're just trying to pay off a debt to get the Germans out of there. And if it wasn't enough, if that, this, that wasn't enough of a humbling trial for the French people to bear, the real stinger was the Germans took the territories of Alsace and Lorraine from the French. And to the French, this was an unforgivable theft. By the way, could we get some more chairs back there, maybe another row of chairs? So we're, we're in 1870. I know many of us don't hang out in 1870 and, and study maps, okay, because the map of Europe changes a, a lot, right? But in 1870, I don't know if you remember at the beginning of, in 1914, I showed you the country of Germany. Remember all the sort of purplish red countries down the middle? And so Italy and Austria, Hungary, and then there was Germany at the top, and Germany was sort of the dominant factor, and its head it looks like the horse going, nay, remember, remember that, okay? So you can see that it's not there. Those countries at the top of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, East Prussia, West Prussia, West Prussia and West Fallen, are all going to gather together, and they're going to attack what is called the Third French Republic there. And they're going to win. And that's what we're talking about right now, which is going to change the landscape of Europe. And so what I did is sort of overlaid that was, it's not a very good overlay, you know, because I sort of did the outline for our, our, our horse head there to show you where Germany is going to be. But you'll notice that there's, oh, that was weird, uh, that there's this uh, purple, I'm sorry, this yellow zone with a star in it. It's sort of hard to miss. Uh, and uh, that's Alsace-Lorraine, just to give you a general zone for it. It's not a specific, you know, it's not very well uh, outlined, but that's going to give you an idea of what the Germans are going to, according to the French, steal. Okay, they're going to take prized territory. And of course, that's the border country to Germany, too. And so those in Alsace-Lorraine, they're French people. And now suddenly they come under the servitude, if you will, the thumb of Germany. And so this is a crisis, this is a calamity, this is a horror of horrors for the French people. The indignity of this, okay, that, remember how I called this the French fury? Okay, that's all going to play into it here. So I, I don't speak French, if you haven't figured that out for the first six messages, we might as well reinforce that in the seventh. So when I mispronounce some of this stuff, just know that that's part of the humor of the series. It's not to be taken too seriously, like we really need to correct Eric on his French. I don't know if all your corrections, if you gave me just how to pronounce this, I don't know if that's going to help me pronounce all the other things that are going to come up. Uh, but mystique diocese. So that's how I would say it. Because you need to do something like this when you're speaking French. You need to you know, twirl your, your curly mustache. But I, you know, so the, I, I know what it means. It's the mystique of Alsace. It's the draw, the magnetic pull of Alsace, and this is what bonds the French people. So that's the magnetic, and I'm also going to call this the magnetic weakness of the French soul. Have you ever had something in your life that you just can't let go of? And God is working on you, but you have, you have a hold. You have a magnet type of connection with something. 
and it just, when it's touched and the enemy reminds you of it, it just stirs you and it really bothers you. Sometimes it's unforgiveness. Sometimes it's a wound in your life, a hurt in your life, and it, you almost feel like you're, you're doing work in solving that problem by resenting it and by exerting frustration towards it, as if that's accomplishing anything other than destroying you. And this is a great illustration because many of us understand this on the individual level, but we don't understand it on a national level. I mean, what a strange thing to have a national level issue where everyone in the country immediately is bonded to one thing. It's like mystique de Alsace. That will stir everyone else. Uh, you know, you just bring up Alsace and Lorraine in a conversation, and every French person immediately has their hand ball up into a fist, and they start looking for their sword. They want to kill a German right there and then. They hate the Germans, and there's reasons for that that, you know, go down through the centuries, but the fact that they stole Alsace and Lorraine from them, and they, it just stirs them up. And none of us can really relate to it. It's not something that we can identify with, which is why we need to touch those zones in our life where we have that tenderness, where there's things in our life where we're extra sensitive to. The French have that. So here's a Winston Churchill. I put a new picture of Winston Churchill. I thought this one would get it, you know, for whatever reason, he's sort of a humorous character to look at too. Uh, and so this comes from his book, The World Crisis, which is about World War I. One night, the German ambassador, this is before World War I, he's just reflecting back. One night, the German ambassador in Great Britain, still was Count Metternich, whom I had known for 10 years, asked me to dine with him. We were alone, and a famous hawk from the emperor's cellars was produced. We had a long talk about Germany and how she had grown great, about Napoleon and the part he had played in uniting her, about the Franco-German War and how it began and how it ended. I said it was, what a pity it was that Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, remember in Realpolitik, he's the big guy in the chair that's the, uh, the realist. What a pity it was that Bismarck had allowed himself to be forced by the soldiers into taking Lorraine. And now Alsace and Lorraine lay at the root of all the European armaments and rival combinations. He said these had been German provinces from remote antiquity until one day in, prof in profound peace, Louis XIV had pranced over the frontier and seized them. I said their, their sympathies were French. He said they were mixed. I said that anyhow, it kept the whole thing alive. France could never forget her lost provinces, and they never ceased to call to her. It's like sort of one of these strange things, almost like a Lord of the Rings type of thing. Ooh, come get me, save me. War is just pending. You see, it's not just the Germans that want war. In a strange way, the French want war, but they don't want to take over Europe. They want their territories back. Germany knows that. Okay, that's going to play into this too. Oh boy, Can, aren't you guys getting into this message? The French response to the humiliation. So they were humiliated. They had to bend their knee in the palace of French kings. They had to pay back five billion francs, and their property was stolen. And so they have something that they've been cultivating. And this is their response. And it's not just a few people. This is the nation. And it even had a name to it. And I don't know that I can pronounce it correctly, but revanchism. Did you hear that? It sounded sort of French when I said that. Revanchism. And do you guys know what that means? It's, our equivalent would be vengeance. Revenge. You can sort of see it in there, right? It's an entire philosophy of the people. Revenge, nurture it, cultivate it, span it into flame because this is what's going to get our property back. We can't forget this. So Barbara Tuckman says it this way, the memory remained a stationary dark shadow on the French consciousness. Now I'm not even gonna try and read that statement. I'll translate it though. Never speak of it, think of it always. You guys see a little uh, unhealth uh, weaving into uh, the French countryside with this one? Never speak of it. Think of it always. Okay, by the way, you know, if we're teaching Christian thought, this is the opposite. This is the wrong direction, guys. This is the type of thing that eats away and rots the soul. It is a root that actually is bitter to the entire life. And this entire nation is convulsing with it. So Victor Hugo, many of you know Les Miserables, uh, and uh, this is a quote from him, not from the book, just a quote from Victor Hugo. 
France will have but one thought, to reconstitute her forces, gather her energy, nourish her sacred anger, raise her young generation to form an army of the whole people, to work without cease, to study the methods and skills of our enemies, to become again a great France, the France of 1792, the France of an idea with a sword. Then one day she will be irresistible. Then she will take back Alsace-Lorraine. Okay, now, like I said, we have to be invited in if we're not from France. This makes no sense. It's like, why, even the conclusion of all of that, why do they want to become a great nation again? To take back what is rightfully theirs. Okay, this is consuming them, and it is contorting their soul, in a sense, destroying them. Barbara Tuckman says this, the one thing that held together all elements of the army whether Old Guard or Republican, Jesuit or Freemason, was the mystique de Alsace. The eyes of all were fixed on the blue line of the Vosges. So there's our little, if you want to call it the blue line, that yellow, I should have made it a blue line, but it's sort of hard when I have France uh, being bluish. But that line, that's the territory that the French are after. And so if Germany's going to attack, what are the French going to go after? Now, let me stop right there. What do you think the Germans know about France? They know that France has deep resentments, and they know what France wants back. And as a result, you have an enemy that functions very similarly to that. If he sees resentment, if he sees unforgiveness, if he sees that root problem in your life, he is going to play it against you. Which in Scripture we understand, you know, Paul is going to say, you know, we should forgive. Why? Because we don't want to be played by the enemy. We, don't, we know his devices. We know he, what he's up to. And so we need to let these things go lest we give the enemy place. And so you could say the same thing to France. France, you may want to forgive your ancient foe. Why? We can't do that because that resentment will be used against you. So the Germans, you know, you could get all stirred up with the French on this, and I don't know which side you're taking, and you might be sort of like me. When it comes to France and Germany, it's really hard for me to take a side. Like I said, I tend to side with Great Britain, who, by the way, isn't doing very well at this time either. They're in the midst of sort of their own little civil war. The whole world feels like it's falling apart right now. We have no strong leadership in any nation. Uh, even America has... Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, which, you know, is, there's debates on that throughout history, how strong of a leader he was. It's like, if we could just go back in time and have Theodore Roosevelt again, just, you know, rewind the clock just a little and grab Theodore. And every nation feels that. It's like, wow, we just, like, in Germany, we lost Otto von Bismarck, we lost Schlieffen, we lost our great leaders, and now we have William II at the time we need strong leadership. The same is true. Alexander III in, in the, for the Tsardom in Russia, now they have Nicholas II. It's like, oh boy. Everyone feels like, <laughs> and ironically, Isaiah 3, now I've mentioned this before in this series, I, Isaiah 3 is going to talk about judgment coming on Israel. And the first movement of judgment isn't drought, isn't disease, it's the removal of leadership strength. It's the removal of manhood from the nation. And what we see, and then you put children in charge. It's like, huh. That, boy, does that sound familiar with what's going on in World War I. It's like a whole bunch of children got put in charge, and like kindergarten uh, rulers are, are now in charge of the world, and you feel like, this isn't steady. This is not going to work very well, and you'd be right. So the Germans are just as upset about all of this as the French. And you could say, what's their issue? They're, they're the big dog in Germany. Well, they're encircled. It's a necessity. You know, they have their reasons, right? But they also have reasons for why they feel they need to crush France. And you could say, didn't you already crush France? Didn't you already humiliate France? Has, isn't that enough for you? No. And you could say, boy, you guys have issues. And their issues make total sense to them, just like our issues typically make sense to us. Like why you don't talk to a certain family member and you give them the cold shoulder when they're around. It's like, you know what? That doesn't translate to everyone else on the outside very well, but I'm sure it makes sense to you why you do that. And when they walk by and they say something nice to you, like, how's your day going? Fine. And then you walk off. And, I, and you know, to everyone around you, that doesn't translate well, right? But to you, you're like, yeah, they need to know that what they did is not forgotten. You know, and if I start getting all 
nice, you know, and kissy face with them, then they may think that that behavior was okay. And so to keep up that tension, I need to keep up the fun, you know, and walk off thing. Meanwhile, the rest of us in the world are going, hmm, that doesn't look very good, okay? And that's the way France and Germany are. I mean, they cannot get along. They cannot talk. They cannot communicate without, you know, guns being pulled out. The Germans are still upset, and even though for us on the outside, we're like, guys, you won the war, you got your nation, you're the most powerful military in the world at this time, you have Alsace-Lorraine. I mean, what's the big deal? So I'll read you the big deal. Barbara Tuckman says it this way. For Germany, 1870 was not a final settlement. The German day in Europe, which they thought had dawned when the German Empire was proclaimed in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, was still postponed. France was not crushed. The French Empire was actually expanding in North Africa and Indochina. The world of art and beauty and style still worshipped at the feet of Paris. Germans were still gnawed by envy of the country they had conquered. Believing themselves superior in soul, in strength, in energy, industry, and national virtue, Germans felt they deserved the dominion of Europe. The work must be completed. So are you guys in the story yet? You, you sort of starting to feel the World War I tensions here? It's like, why would a world go to war? And there's a whole bunch of countries here that don't want this war, and a lot of people in Germany that don't want a war, even Wilhelm II, he wants to bluster and talk about it, and he just wants France to capitulate and give up, right? He doesn't really want to fight, but their entire orientation is ready to fight, and it's pretty difficult to stop what we see taking place. The sway of revenge, it's too powerful a thing to be wielded by man. When you are carrying around vengeance, revanchism, again, I'm probably saying it incorrectly, but when you're carrying that around, it will overwhelm you and cause you to do things that are beyond what you would want to do. You will say things you really wish you hadn't said. You will do things that you really wish you wouldn't have done. I mean, murder oftentimes can come out of this, and you would have never said, oh, I, I want to murder someone, but in a sense, you sort of wish you could, and that is unrestrainable in the human soul. You were not meant to wield it. It is too big for man to carry, and so when there is an injustice, God teaches us a proper means of handling it, and it, it doesn't sound strong enough to us when he says, forgive that. God, I can't because it needs to be addressed. Would you give it to me? Because I am big enough to handle addressing those things. And part of forgiveness is a faith issue of trusting God with justice. Trusting God is greater. And God also wants to train our souls that this is nullifying the chief purpose that we have, which is to reveal him. And love is his chief language. And he is willing to show mercy and willing to forgive and willing to even love his enemies. But this revanchism, this vengeance, spoils the, the entire, uh, I was going to say the milk inside of our soul. It spoils the purpose. It spoils the reason we're here, which is to reveal the invisible realm. And that is not how God behaves. We have a God who is merciful to us even though we deserve far worse than, we've done far worse than what the Germans did to the French. And yet God has not responded as the French. God has responded very differently, and he wants to show us this pattern, not because it's weaker. Ironically, it's stronger. You want to win a war, follow Jesus as your commander-in-chief. And yet most of us would look at him, he's like, that, Jesus is the classic pacifist. He's not going to do anything about it. He's going to let evil run rampant throughout Europe. He's not even going to lift a finger. You don't know your God well enough when you say that. You need to recognize that our God is just. Though he is mercy, his mercy is not a weakness. Though he is love, his love is not a weakness. He is a God who redeems. I mean, it sounds strange to win your enemies in and through love. It's like, what a strange mechanism for winning a war by winning your enemy and having them all repent. 
You know, it's like that, that's a strange uh, mechanism for defeating a country. And yet, revival is one of the greatest methods for changing hostilities and dimming uh, that bright flame of revenge. Romans 12, 19 says it very clearly. Revenge is mine, says the Lord. This, don't try and carry it around. You see, when you carry this around, this becomes a great liability to your soul. So I have a, it's not a scripture quote, but it's sort of, to the, to the French it might as well be, because this was the scriptures for them. Revenge is ours, says the people of France. And this even has a name. You'll notice that I put a name behind it. It's called the Doctrine of the Offensive. And ironically, it's, it's a name almost with two meanings, even though I don't think they meant the first meaning that I could bring up, which is like the offended. The doctrine of the offended would be a good way of saying it. However, what it translates to them is the doctrine of the offensive, which means we never play on the defensive, we take it to them. And that's their entire mentality. The French snarl and sneer and spit upon any notion of building a defense work and saying, oh, let's, let's defend ourselves against Germany. No, no, we don't defend ourselves against Germany. We take Germany. And it's a complete, you know, it's, it's throughout and replete in their entire military system. The doctrine of the offensive. And I said underneath it, and it's seven beastly horns. So it probably has a lot more horns than this. I'm just going to pick seven, and I'm going to try and explain how the French thought in this exact time period by giving you a few ideas, a few thoughts. So the first one, which is the name, this is actually what they would say is the doctrine of the offensive, Elon Vital, I don't know if I'm saying it correct, it's a pretty cool phrase, which is the vital impetus or the driving force. Their soldiers had Elon Vital, and when I study it, my first blush is that is great. These guys fear nothing. And they are always on the offensive, and they are willing to go into any situation. It's a certain virtue and nobility in the way they, they view sacrifice in battle. You know, so like the, the, the leaders of the military, uh, so the officers in a time of battle would actually stand up even amidst the hell, you know, hell of fire of, gun, of bullets and of artillery shell and raise their hand in the air as if to show I do not fear anything. And if, if your leaders don't fear anything, then the, the soldiers under them don't fear anything either. But when something's flying at you, just stand there with your hand up in the air, and by the way, with a red cap and red trousers, this, the, and I'll get into this, but the French would not camouflage. They considered it weakness. Why would we camouflage? We want the enemy to see that we don't fear them. Uh, you guys might want to rethink that. Uh, you know, that's really not the best idea. <laughs> that's like what all of us are thinking. So you have to admit, when you fir at first blush, you're like, I like this. This is very impressive. And I'm not going to say it's all wrong. I'm going to say that there's a root problem in their honor, in their sense of, uh, you know, what they call cran, which is, we, we would translate guts. There is something in it that is very inspiring to me as a man but there's also something dark about it that is wrong, and it doesn't allow actual clear thinking on the matter. There are going to be various military leaders that are going to propose that if Germany does this, if Germany does this, we should build defensive measures against it. And those people are removed from the military. You are not allowed to speak against the offensive maneuvering. We do not think defensively. We think offensively, which ironically sounds a little like some of my sermons. You know, when I say, God has given us no defense, no armor for the back. Our job is to think offensively and not defensively. And then I have this flashback to World War I, and I'm like, hmm, am I French? Uh, because that's exactly how they thought. And so I, I esteem it. I like it. However, as I study it, I'm like, yeah, you probably should build some defense ideas into this. <laughs> because Christianity is both. It is both offensive and there's defensive measures. When you hold up a shield... Uh, to repel a fiery dart, well, that's a defensive measure, even though you can use that same shield to bop the enemy in the nose on your offensive maneuvering as you're going closer and closer to him as he's shooting arrows at you, and he starts to panic. This guy doesn't fear me. Yeah, you could use it for both. So, Elan Vital, where it comes from, is the doctrine of evolution. 
This is actually the conclusion that is going to sweep over the nation. They're going to actually study the Germans and figure out why the Germans beat them in 1870. And they're going to conclude that the, the Germans wanted out of their servitude and their slavery. They did not want to be under the boot of France. And as a result, they were more bold in battle. And there's something about the creature instinct to get rid of shackles and to be free. And they, they say this is evolution. This is how evolution works. There was a guy that wrote a book about this that basically is going to talk about Elan Vital, this driving impetus, this life force within man that has to free itself from bondage. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to argue that there is something in us. However, it doesn't become, it come out of the, uh, the evolution of man. It's that God designed us for liberty. And so as a result, but they have a very contorted idea of this. And so we're going to call it the creature instinct to free oneself from chains of servitude. And again, another French word up here. Sorry, guys. I, I, more apologizing to, uh, you know, for my French pronunciation than anything. Attack à outrance. Attack to excess. This is such an interesting model that they have for war. And I'm going to give you a quote of someone else trying to describe it. The attack to excess, e excess channeled Elan Vital as it was literally for the attacking army to be zealous professional soldiers and march toward gunfire with so much intensity that the enemy would lose their will to survive. So this is their thought, is that in a military situation, you so aggressively go at the enemy guns when they're firing at you, screaming, yelling, you know, sort of like an animal, that it freaks out the enemy. And there's something to, you know, still, if you, if you study any kind of martial arts, and, you know, one of the first techniques when someone is attacking you is you just make a lot of noise. And you freak them out. You're like, ha! You know, back. And then suddenly they're like, ha! And they go run it off. It's like, huh, that was effective. You know, because when someone is skulking around and trying to steal from your house, and suddenly you hop out from around the corner and go, ah! <laughs> that freaks them out, okay? Because you're the one that's supposed to be afraid. Instead, you're the one that's screaming and yelling, saying, get out, and they freak out, and they go running, right? It's a tactic, and they're, they're using it not just in, you know, the guy sneaking into their home. This is like the whole military offensive. Could you imagine what this would be like if you're a German sitting there, and then suddenly over the hill comes 10,000 screaming French that seem fearless, and this is what they envisioned. They envisioned how that would translate to the German mind. The Germans will be freaked out. This is how we're going to win this thing. And then this is one we've already covered, revanchism, vengeance. This was, this is Thomas First's quote, this was a specific sort of revenge for past military defeats over, over territory. Ilan Vital came to the French soldiers during this emotional state. So how would they get boiled up into the frenzy for the offensive, they would cultivate, or as the French would say, channel their Elan Vital or their revanchism. So they would stir themselves up into a fury. And by the way, if you remember my King Alfred series and you remember the berserkers, and the, it's called the berserker rage, hmm, which was demon possession, I would say, boy, those two sound similar. In other words, what you have is something that you're giving over to the powers of darkness, and they felt more bold when they did that. And so they trained their military how to channel this revanchism. Alsace, 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 Alsace. I don't know about you, but I'm already concerned about the health of France. Okay, this is literally overriding common sense. It's like, are you sure this is healthy? We have to win. And don't you feel it when we get that revenge going? Don't you feel your boldness? Like you don't care if you get shot in the head all of a sudden. And so many of us are like, I don't want to be shot in the head. You're like, try this. Revanchism. That'll help you. And that's what they were coming to the conclusion of. How do you make bold soldiers? You have to give them something bigger than themselves to die for. They have to be so stirred at such a level for, with a purpose greater than themselves. And ironically, we could bottle that statement and say, I agree. However, that's not revenge, and that's not trying to get mad at Alsace and Lorraine. For us Christians, we have to have something greater than ourselves, than our own personal skin to live for. It's like they're on to something, but it's like a twisted, deformed version of it. It's 
called the cult of the offensive. I know, it's not a sales pitch for any of us to join it, is it? But that's what it was. It's like, all right, as a military, you enter into a cult of the offensive. This is how we think. This is how we breathe. You say anything against it, we'll remove you from the military. It was a closed system. So they considered weakness is the heresy of the soldier. So for a soldier to not run to the battle, to not cultivate the revanchism, it created weakness. We don't want you. Out. Weakness is heresy amongst the soldiers. And you have to admit, if you're building a, a great military machine, you know, this has some wisdom to it. I mean, there's some good points here. So here's Thomas first his statement on it. A strategy that solely emphasized attacks and wars and that rendered defense as a moral and strategic weakness. Defense is a moral weakness and a strategic weakness. Isn't that just an interesting statement? Ironically, this mentality is not going to last very long in the war. Isn't that an interesting statement? So you could be very impressed with it going, I love the French's mentality. I mean, I was studying it the other day. Eric gave a message. It was the seventh episode. You should listen to it. You know, it's not going to work. And they're pretty soon going to recognize that unless they get on the defensive, they're all going to die. I mean, literally, they're losing hundreds of thousands of men in what's called the meat grinder because they're standing up in battle and just getting blown away. They have cloth caps on their head. They have no defense because they don't need defense. That's, that's, that's moral heresy to do it. And as a result, hundreds of thousands of these men that believe this are going to be obliterated in the first few weeks of World War I. Number five, here's the name of our message. Aren't you guys excited that we finally got here? It's called Fury Francois, French Fury. Sorry for those of you that speak French. I know there's some of you in here that are like just wanting to get up and say, here's how you pronounce it, Eric. Uh, believe me, I'll get that. I'll have people that'll text me uh, some, some great uh, solutions for how I could solve this. So here's what it is. It's a, that word is a vivid description of the animated French soldier channeling this uber-aggressive approach to conflict. So when you're doing this, what, how would you describe it? It's French fury. That's what they're bringing to battle. They're bringing fury. Number six, red kepis. That's their hats. A kepis uh, is a hat. And AKA, the way we could call this is we are, as a military unit, as a nation, we are anti-camouflage. Well, the Brits are using this really cool, you know, khaki color. Uh, the Germans are using sort of this light blue, and so you, when they're coming over the horizon, you can't even see them. They blend in with, like, the sky. And, but we have our red trousers, our blue coats, and our red hats. Yes, it's the cult of the offensive. We are unafraid. And so not only are we, not una are we unafraid, but we're going to boldly declare our location because we believe that we're stronger than you. Despite wars around the world showing that camouflage was useful, the French army, unlike the British and Germans, remained in blue coats with red kepis and trousers. Camouflage was not prudent, but a symbol of weakness. So here's at least, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is the French going off to war in 1914. And if, you, if I gave a contrast with the Brits and the, uh, the Germans, you'd understand how loud these guys are. And imagine standing up, because the officers would have their white gloves, and they would stand in the battle with their white glove. Okay, it's like, please, strike me, and they're all going to be killed. I mean, this is just like, it, it is one of the craziest storylines, because all of us could esteem the nobility of it, but it's a nobility from a previous era before artillery shell and machine gun fire. And when you, you, know, you have your rifle, but you don't know how to shoot it very well, and it can only shoot this distance, right, accurately. And so a guy could stand up and risk his life, and, you know, there's an odds on, you know, possibility he's going to survive the day. And wow, that was inspiring to all the men. There is no possible way he's going to survive the day now. When someone is going, with shooting machine gun fire across the horizon, and this guy's standing there, how many times over do you think he can survive that? And when artillery shells going off and literally blowing people back, unless they are in the ground, unless they are somehow dug in, they're just all dead. And this is exactly how World War I is going to start. Number seven, the purity of the ranks. They were also anti-reservists. You know, the, the way that a nation, when it comes to war, 
in modern warfare, they're going to draft, they're going to bring up volunteers or you know, reservists, and this is critical. Germany has so many more soldiers because they're willing to use their reservists. France at the beginning is really struggling in their military doctrine if, with its, if they should use it. Most soldiers do not want reservists. Why? Because they don't understand revanchism. They don't understand Elan Vital. They haven't been trained in the cults of the offensive. They're not initiated to this. We don't want that person next to us. That's going to add weakness to our ranks. And so it's, everything about this is counterintuitive to winning World War I, and yet everything about this is how they're going to approach it. The army discriminated against the use of army reservists, for they did not possess this same warrior spirit that those channeling, I don't like the word channeling, but it's, that's the word they would use, channeling the Elan Vital possessed. So here's a guy named De, De Grand Mason, and he said, this is the same idea that I just expressed. Risking your life at every step for hours on end is not a game for the common man. The common man is not fit for war, which those of us that are common men would probably say, yeah, agreed, you don't need to draft me up, I'm fine here. But these, the military of France had so cultivated this that they were afraid of bringing in the common men into the ranks lest they just, you know, mess it all up. Number eight, immunity to transvalitis. So transvalitis is, it sounds like a disease. It's, it is. In the French mind, it's a disease. And it's this. Okay, say I'm a, a leader, a military leader, and all my men are dying. Transvalitis is the fear of losing all your men. It's the fear of actually being decimated. And so what the tendency is, is to retreat, is to turn back. But that's a disease to the French. So as a result, they want to train their leaders that even if everyone dies, they die for a good reason. But there isn't a point where you turn and run. And so all of us would be like, if you're a soldier in that situation, you can imagine the common man walking into that going, well, what if we're, you know, we're surrounded? I mean, do we just like sit there or do we fight? I mean, do we, or do we run if we had a chance? What if there's an opening? Can I get out of it? No. And so is, this is a paralyzing thing. Ironically, it's going to play a pretty big role uh, in the very beginning of the war too. So never, this is how I'm going to define it. Never dreading the extreme loss of life in battle. Could you imagine trying to become immune to that? All these men that you love are dying and yet you need to be immune to feeling about that because what you're serving is mystique de Alsace. You're doing something greater for something greater than yourself. Transvalitis is that potentially paralyzing fear among the general staff of losing too many troops in battle, causing them to pull back on the defensive instead of maintaining the offensive always. We never go on the defensive. So the Germans sack, betting on the revanchism of the French. The Germans know that all the French are totally magnetized with one thing. They want Alsace-Lorraine back. So if you know that and you're Schlieffen, what are you going to do? You're going to play that against the French as opposed to play against it. Like, they're not going to attack right in that zone and then get all the French stirred up. That's where the French want to take anyways. So they want to come through Belgium. Meanwhile, they know the French are going to go into Alsace-Lorraine. They know the French. And so they're creating what's called the sack. They're going to give the French the sense that they're winning. And they're going to keep pulling back. And the French are like, yeah, yeah, see, our offensive is working. And they're going to wrap them in a sack and then turn it on them. I just described the beginning of World War I for the French and hundreds of thousands. That's not an exaggeration. Hundreds of thousands. Just like in one day, 75,000 French could die. It is such a massive number of casualties that the French people have no grid for this. No grid whatsoever. Barbara Tuckman says it this way. Essential to the plan was deliberately weak German, was a deliberately weak German left wing on the Alsace-Lorraine front, which would tempt the French in that area forward into a sack between Metz and the Vosges. It was expected that the French, intent on, upon liberating their lost provinces, would attack here. And it was considered so much the better for the success of the German plan if they did. For they could be held in the sack by the German left wing while the main victory was obtained from behind. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. 
Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive, says Paul. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should, be adva- should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So the enemy has devices. His entire design is to get us into a sack, is to distract us. He wants to move over here in our life, and so as a result, he's going to bait us with our magnets, with our mystique de alces, with that one part of our life where there is hurt, where there is a pain that we desire remedied. Okay, this happens in various things. We could have something in our life which we are unwilling to let go of. And so, say, relationships of the opposite sex, the pursuit of the opposite sex, and God's like, could you just entrust that to me? But we can't, because we want to solve this area of our life. So what does the enemy do? He creates a sack. In other words, he wants to bait us into that point of magnetism so he can strike us in a different way. God says, look, I can help you win this thing, but I need you to let go of Alsace and Lorraine. I can't, God. I can't. That, is, that was theft. That was wrong. I'm not going to say it was right, but I'm going to say, can you let it go? Can you entrust that to me? Can you put that vengeance in my hands instead of trying to take it in yours? You see, the French are vulnerable because of this weirdness that has crept into their thinking. They are controlled by vengeance, and as a result, they are being played in this. And I'm not saying I'm necessarily cheering on the French in World War I, but I sort of am. Uh, you know, I don't know how to describe it. It's a weird thing because the German army, it's not Hitler. I mean, they didn't do anything that bad. I sort of like William II, but I don't want France to have that sledgehammer on their head. There's part of me that feels like they're being attacked here and I want to see them stand their ground. However, I really want to, if, you, if, they were, if I was gonna be a consultant to them, it's like I really want to be a diplomat that talks to Germany, talks to France, and what can we do about Alsace-Lorraine? That's a little better than this. Okay, can we work something out? That's like classic Eric here. There were plenty of people back then that were thinking the same thing. Winston Churchill's been thinking that for a long time. That's why I read that quote. So we have the tension. Lest Satan should take advantage of us. Why should you forgive? Lest Satan should take advantage of us. And then look at this line. For we are not ignorant of his devices. And I would say, I don't know that that's true. I think many of us are ignorant of his devices. When it talks about before the sun goes down, you know, making things right and forgiving, lest the enemy gain place in your life. Why? Why would he gain place through that? Because there is a gap or a crevice in our life that is created through disagreement with the kingdom of heaven. It's like a snowy day, it's frigid cold outside, and, you know, I say, hey guys, could we leave the windows in here uh, shut so we don't, you know, uh, work the furnace too hard, and you know we can maintain a good temperature in here. In our, uh, and then one of you is like, no, and you just open up the, the door and the, all the windows. And what do we have? We have outside temperature coming in through that disobedience. And as a result, the atmosphere in here becomes chilly. This is exactly what can happen in our lives when we walk in a disagreement with the clear revelation of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Now, the context is talking about a man and a woman uh, in marriage, and yet the statement here is extremely fascinating, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So, in other words, Satan is able to tempt us when we lack self-control or containment. In other words, we must get this. That is a lack of self-control. What the French are exhibiting is a lack of control of their soul. They're not in agreement with the kingdom pattern, and as a result, they're going to be tempted in World War I. And it works beautifully if you want to say it that way. The cost of unforgiveness. The cost of unforgiveness is a battle in World War I that I could summarize as the battle of the frontiers. Getting caught in the sack of vengeance. An unscrupulous enemy. Now, I, I admit, Germany is, Germany's sort of mean. Okay, that what they're doing to France and what they're going to do to France is not something I want to cheer on. And it's unscrupulous. It's devious, just like our enemy. Our enemy is very similar to what we're going to see the Germans do in this. So here's just an illustration of what's going to happen right before this, in, right before World War I in the Mediterranean. 
according to the, and I can't say this German word, Kriegsbrock, or conduct of war manual issued by the German general staff, the putting on of enemy uniforms and the use of enemy or neutral flags or insignia with the aim of deception are declared permissible. So in other words, say you are a ship in the Mediterranean, and it's known, if you're German, they may attack you right now with where things were at, okay? And I could explain that, but that's, I'm not going to go into that. So what they did is they put up a Russian flag and put on Russian uniforms, and they masqueraded to the Allies that they were a Russian ship. And listen to what it says. As the official embodiment of German thinking on these matters, the Kriegsbrock was considered to supersede Germany's signature on the Hague Convention, of which Article 23 prohibited the use of disguise in enemy colors. So a Hague Convention, which is a peace conference, which is going to cause all the nations, and Germany signed it, to say, we will not do this. Look at these turkeys. We haven't even started the war, and the first thing they're doing is sticking up a Russian flag and dressing in Russian uniforms, which is directly against the agreement. In other words, you cannot try and deceive your enemy that way. You see the French going the opposite. We're not going to deceive. We're going to wear our red trousers and our red hat and be proudly French. The Germans are more subtle, and as a result, they're going to be very, very effective in what they do. I mean, you have to be impressed with the German military system. It's smart, and it's good, and it looks like it's going to win World War I. Now, I haven't given any spoilers away of who's going to win, right? But the French, they're not looking so hot. Uh, they're getting caught in the German sack. The Germans, yeah, they blundered. They went into Belgium, which is going to awaken Great Britain, and it's going to bring Great Britain into the war, but they have 950 hours. Can they crush France? Can they get Paris in 950 hours? Isn't this exciting? Now, since the war went on four years, I've already given that away. Some of you are like, hmm, I'm a little dubious about the fact that they're going to win this in 950 hours. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. We have an enemy that is looking for mystique de Alsace points in us. And as a result, we need to allow the Spirit of God to work in those, direct, those areas specifically. Ephesians 6, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. God has given us armament that isn't just able to sustain us, but enable, it enables us to win. We have been given what we need to be victorious in this battle. When we heed wrong mentality and we cultivate vengeance, for instance, what the French are going to cultivate, World War I is going to be very difficult for them as a result. In other words, their very mentalities that they're going to bring into this are going to have to be checked, and they're going to have to be convicted about their mentalities. And it's pretty ironic when one of the main sponsors of the cult of the offensive is going to call France to go on the defensive. You could imagine how hard that was for Joseph Joffre to come to that place and to call his troops to the defensive because that was heresy to the French. It's either that or lose your nation. You choose. It's sort of like you either come in alignment with the kingdom pattern even though you may think that sounds like weakness to show mercy, to forgive, and to love. However, it's the system that works. God knows how he built us and he knows how to win the battles and win the war. Father, I ask that you would build us as soldiers, good soldiers, and that we would be aware and alert to the enemy's devices, and that we would live in such a way where there is nothing that can bait us in the wrong way, but that we have relinquished those places of hurt and harm so that you can truly lead us effectively into this battle. Lord, we trust you. It's in the precious name we pray. Amen.